This presentation is on poor flush toilets, which can be either single pit units or alternating twin pit systems. This is a single pit poor flush toilet. A is the superstructure, B the squat pan and water seal, C the connecting pipework, and D the leach pit. Poor flush toilets are especially suitable for those who use water for anal cleansing, but they're also okay for those who don't. The excreta are manually flushed with about 2 to 3 litres of water into the leach pit. This slide shows an ergonomic design for the squat pan developed by the Indian Building Research Establishment in Rorke. The key feature is the 20 mm water seal depth, which enables effective flushing with just 2 to 3 litres of water. This is in contrast to the situation here in England, where the water seal depth is 50 mm and 9 litres of water are used per flush. These polypropylene squat pan and water seal units are made by an NGO in India. They're easy to keep clean and they only cost around 70 rupees, that's less than a pound. For sitters, this poor flush bowl, developed over 30 years ago in Colombia, is very suitable and also low cost. Many poor flush toilets are single pit systems, but increasingly, and especially in peri-urban areas, alternating twin pit systems are used. There are two leach pits, but only one is used at any one time, usually for a period of at least a year, and often for two years. When this pit is full, it's taken out of service, and the other one put into service. Just before the second one is full, the first is emptied, and it's safe for this to be done manually, as its contents are all at least a year old. This is the flow diversion box between the squat pan and the two pits. The outlet to the pit not in use is blocked off, usually with a brick wrapped in hessian, so the excreta are directed to the pit in use. This is a demonstration poor flush toilet we built some years ago near Mombasa in Kenya, and you can see the squat pan, the flow diversion box, and the two pits. This is the first slide of a sequence of slides showing the construction of an alternating twin pit poor flush toilet in Pakistan. First of all, the location of the two pits and the flow diversion box are marked out on the ground. The pits are then excavated, and in this case, lined with open joint brickwork. The vertical joints, except for the top few courses, are left unmortared so that the liquids can infiltrate into the surrounding soil. The squat pan is carefully positioned and levelled, and then fixed in this position by embedding it in mortar. Finally, cover slabs, usually of reinforced concrete, are placed over the two leach pits and the flow diversion box, and a superstructure built over the squat pan. Poor flush toilets can be in-house facilities, and they're not restricted to being only on the ground floor. In high-density peri-urban areas, the leach pits can be placed in the lane adjacent to the house they serve, and where space is really tight, they can be designed like this, although it would be better to extend the pit dividing wall outwards and downwards to prevent, or at least minimise, pathogens from the pit in use from recontaminating the contents of the pit not in use. This slide from Sri Lanka shows a simple rainwater collection system to permit rainwater, rather than more expensive drinking water, to be used for poor flushing. With dry alternating twin pits, that's to say pits wholly above the groundwater table, it's OK to have them emptied manually, as the contents are pretty well composted. They're odourless and look rather like soil, and more importantly, because the contents are at least a year old, all the excreted pathogens, with the exception of a few ascaris eggs, will be dead. Some rather conservative hydrogeologists and environmentalists are often very much over-concerned about groundwater pollution from on-site sanitation systems, especially poor flush toilets, as they produce more and more contaminated wastewater than VIP latrines, for example. My view is that, from the public health perspective of minimising disease transmission today, it's often better to have the groundwater polluted rather than the ground. Really, the groundwater should only be protected when it's absolutely necessary to do so, not just because groundwater should never be polluted. And we now know quite a bit about how to minimise groundwater pollution. This algorithm asks a series of questions, the answers to which lead to recommendations for the minimum separation between latrine pits and shallow wells, either 10 or 15 metres, although there's also recommendations to seek further advice from an experienced but also sensible local hydrogeologist. The key feature which minimises pathogen travel away from the pit is the depth of the unsaturated zone, 
that is to say the distance between the pit base and the groundwater table, and this should be at least 2 metres. Even if it's not 2 metres, there are things we can do to minimise groundwater pollution. We can, for example, surround the pit by an annulus of sand, as pathogen travel in unsaturated sand is very poor. The annulus should be at least 500 millimetres thick, and the sand should be small, no greater than 1 millimetre in size.